Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with yet another The Tim May Show. Might as well throw a th the in front of that. What do you think, Chimney Chekwa? The Tim May Show. I like it. I like it a lot. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and, yeah, and making an encore performance is Chimney Chekwa because, Chimney, we spent all last week at LettermanRow.com uh, chopping up the uh the cornerback room at Ohio State you know we're the guys that are rising uh, guys that can be better uh where they can be better you know the uh I, I would I don't know I would just basically say everybody feels upbeat about it because most of these guys like Denzel Burke uh you know went through a tough year last year mainly because he couldn't practice much because of his injury situation which kept compounding one on top of another uh, Jordan Hancock missed more than half the year with a hamstring uh, pull. They've got a new kid in, uh, Davis and Nick Benoson, transferred in from Ole Miss. I could go right on down the line of these guys, but uh, they, the whole defense went through what I'd call a year of hard knocks last season, yeah. coming off a year of hard knocks, really. Right. you know, right. um, it, Not quite the silver bullet level, let's put it that way. We're going to get into that in a minute because uh, you were part of a couple of really good silver bullet Defense is way back in the 2000 and 2010s decade, but uh, yep. uh, but Tim D, uh, once again, welcome to the Tim May Show. And and number two, just what what should these cornerbacks going into camp? Just what's your take uh, on what they should be concentrating on? What you know, number one, and defensively, what this defense should be concentrating on going going into this camp? Yeah, I think the big thing is really finishing plays. I think you know you go into last year and I. Uh, you mentioned two years of hard knock when it comes to defense, but they're two very different years. One year, there was a lot of bad, <laughs> in my opinion. And then this year, they took a step forward, but still, they still weren't what we expect from a, a Ohio State silver bullet type defense. And what they, what I think they lacked a lot this past year is finishing plays, being able to finish and protecting the deep explosive play when you look at the, the the games that were lost you could point to three or four plays and you would see a, a completely different outcome right um but you know you mentioned guys being hurt guys being injured i think you know going into this year is a better situation from that standpoint i think those guys are are more or less more or less veterans at the college level now um but the big thing i want to see from them especially from the cornerback room is being able not just to be in position but to go and finish plays, make plays, create turnovers, um, and that really that's when you see them actually take the next step. Yeah, and uh, let's get into a little personalities here. I mean, like Denzel Burke had a really flashy, you know, in some in some phases, great uh, freshman season, and then last yeah. year, you know, he he gets injured in preseason camp, still plays. Uh, but you know, breaks up breaks a bone, you know, a leg injury breaks a bone in his hand. Uh, you know, uh, has a shoulder problem, one thing after another and stuff. It was literally, he was snake bit. I'm trying to remember, did you have a, did you sort of have a season like that uh, in your career, but either in the uh, college or NFL ranks where you just, you couldn't get on the field enough to practice, much less really get your uh, rudiments down, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, that was pretty much my NFL career, to be honest. But <laughs> in, in, in college, um, my junior year, my restaurant junior year, I, I, uh, I tore my, Hip flexor running track, it tore off some, you know, bow, a piece of some of bow fragments. And then going into the season, like you get surgery before the season, then you're out for the season, or you can wait till after the season and play hurt. Yeah. And so I played hurt. Um, and I, 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 you know, I can feel for Denzel because you never, you never feel very confident because you're just not the same person, right? You're just not the same person. You could do a lot of the stuff. If you see a guy run, he's like, he looks like he can run. He looks like he can jump. He looks like he can move. But you don't have the same pop that you had before. And that's challenging for a corner where a lot of the position is really based off of confidence, yeah. right? Because yeah. now you give up a pass, and now your confidence uh, can 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 weigh a little bit more. So, you know, I, I think you know, him being healthy would be a big part of being able to have a successful year and being able to be confident and have the same swag that he came in with as a true freshman. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, I, I use a lot of auto racing analogies. And to me, it's like an, a car that was really fast one, you know, one season. You get it back and, there's, and and one of the wheels is a little bit wobbly. Let's put it, you know, that generically. Yeah. 
a little bit wobbly. The steering isn't quite as tight as it used to be. When you press the gas, the acceleration isn't what it was, or it, or it kind of is herky-jerky. And it's hard to have confidence when you go into a corner, you know what I mean? Right. Driving a car like that, right? And and I would think Denzel had to, no matter what he's, how he, how, how valiantly he went out there on occasion, had to have those kind of like what you call nagging little doubts in his head. If I press the gas here, am I going to blow a tire, right? Right, right. I think that's a challenge. But I also think, you know, as with as you age, as you continue to go, as you go through some of those challenges, you learn some more of the nuances of football, some of the the things that you can do better in certain situations that, you know, whether you have you're dealing with a nagging injury here or there, or regardless of what the situation is, you can put yourself in a better position to make a play. I yeah. think um I think his freshman year, he's just a talented guy. So, you know, just off pure raw talent and ability, he can make plays. But there, there comes a time when you start to understand, okay, I could put myself in a better position to make plays. And going through struggles, <laughs> that's the reality of life, going through struggles help you get to that point. So I'm excited to see, you know, what he gives us this year, and I'm really rooting for the kid. Yeah, and what, what, do, you, what do you think about that that cornerback room? I know you keep up with things. You do, you do a podcast yeah. we're going to get to here in a minute, and uh, you're going to be much more visible for Ohio State fans as this season goes on, uh, and we'll get into some other things, but – what do you just think about that room in general? You know, like the guys I named, uh, Jordan Hancock, who who had to put up with that you know hamstring pull all last year, finally came back and played a pretty good bit and looked really good in the spring. Uh, Davis and Nick Benoson, who started, what, 10, 11 games at Ole Miss last year yeah. as a freshman. And, man, you look at him, he looks like – he look he looks almost like, but not – I'm not going to put him in that realm yet, Jeffrey Okuda – like reincarnate, you know what I mean, from the standpoint of he's long, uh, he's fast, yep. uh, he has a lot of confidence. Jair Brown is back, and they're Jair. trying to figure out a way to maybe use him at, at a slot corner deal, which they, which I think is encouraging for this defense. But just what's your take on this room? Uh, just the yeah. creme so de la creme I, I, of the room, yeah? Yes, yeah, so I love the versatility. I love the competition. Um, and it's, it's a big thing. Competition is huge because competition – now allows every individual in that room to look at themselves and say, okay, what do I need to do to get on the field? Yeah. Right. What else do I need to improve on to be able to get on the field? And they have a good group of guys who can compete and be able to look at the guy left, left and right and say, okay, I see what he's doing wrong here. I'm going to try not to do the same thing. So that, that, that leads to improvement. I, I really like the move of bringing uh, Davidson from Ole Miss, someone who, someone with experience, someone who finishes play. I mean, that's a guy who finishes plays, and that's why I think was lacking the most is being able to finish. If you watch his film, he's not always in great coverage. He's not always in great position, but he finishes. He yeah. makes the offense make the play. Um, and I, I think that is going to lead to other guys doing the same thing. So I, I really like the room. I think it's an opportunity for him to break out this year. I'm interested in how they use him, you know, who plays slot, who plays on the edges. I, I honestly think uh, Jordan Hancock would be a, a – could be a good slot corner. I'm not sure they're going to even try to use him in that capacity, but I think the way he moves, he would work well as a slot corner. I love the idea of putting Jair on the uh, Jair Brown on the field as well, but I really would like to see three corners on the field in you know some of these these um, ten personnel passing situations, get speed on speed, and let these guys play ball. Yeah, honest. sort of an evolution of this four two five. The five made up of three safeties and two corners. Maybe you'd like to see three corners and two safeties a little bit, right? I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and Davidson to me is a he. He's, he has size. He's a guy that's kind of to me is kind of a hybrid. You know, he could play. Yeah. I think I think he could play a safety or a corner. Which, I and mean, I don't know if they're going to use him in this capacity either. But you know, um, because of the physicality that he comes to comes to the game with, I mean, you could play three corners and not lose anything from a safety standpoint. Um, and that's just the reality. I think, you know, when we look back at that the game against Georgia and you see um, probably the fastest guy on the field uh, get matched up in, in, a, in, a, in an unlikely position uh, against one of our guys, knowing that, you know, I'm not saying that he, that he couldn't necessarily run with them, but you would like to put uh, speed on speed and let a guy who can run with them be on him. So I, I'm, I'm interested to see how they use those corners. I do think we have a good cornerback room. And I also think we have good guys coming in. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'm liking what they're doing, at least from a talent standpoint. And hopefully I'm hopeful that it's going to translate to wins on the field. Yeah. I was going to say you as a, as a former player at Ohio state and in the NFL, when you saw that matchup, you know, Michigan got to that matchup a couple of times too. 
you know, they got the mismatch they wanted in the slot or whatever you, you know, wherever on the field. They did a pretty good job of game planning Ohio State defense along as Georgia did. You know, the Ohio State defense shut down Georgia in the third quarter. And then all of a sudden it was like, you know, and and Jim Knowles took blame for that, you know, that uh, uh, the chess game went the other way, you know, in the fourth quarter and stuff. But when you see those mismatches, do you or when you're watching it on television or live, are you just kind of saying to yourself as an Ohio State fan, gosh, I hope that quarterback doesn't see that. You know what I mean? Well, you know, sometimes you don't know it's a mismatch until you see it play out. You yeah. know, like Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That, and, and that's where it comes down to. Like, like a maybe, track mate. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know, in hindsight, like I think I would like I would like to get a faster guy or a better guy, a guy more comfortable in that position, right? But yeah. at the same time, you know, going into it, it's like, well, maybe this guy can run with it. Maybe they got some help deep. Well, he doesn't have to be he doesn't have to be pressed to be after to chase this all the way, right? There's there's a safety out there that's peddling. It looks like there may be a guy who's giving him some support. So sometimes I'm not sure if they if they executed in the way that the the defense was designed. And it, like I said, you don't know it's truly a mismatch sometimes until you until you see it play out. You're like, yeah, I wish it would have gone another way. <laughs> yeah, that's what kind of drove me crazy last year a little bit when I started breaking it all down after the season was over. Is how you had quote, three safeties, end quote, on the field at times, and no safety deep. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, what are you what are you doing? I mean, there's got to be some – there's got to be a fireman back there somewhere, right? You know what I mean? Coming coming out of the bullpen. I mean, it, and I think they've addressed that. You know, obviously, um, second year under Jim Knowles with that four two five defense, everybody's going to know their role better than they did a year ago. Uh, number two, the coaches are going to know how to coach it better. Yeah, agreed. I mean, they, yeah. you made Tim Walton – uh, Ryan Day made Tim Walton basically the head of the secondary uh, or pass defense, uh, you know, scheme of things or the pass defense coordinator, whatever, you know, that truly means. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, of course, Perry, Perry Eliano, the uh, safeties coach, they all work, they all work in together. But uh, what, what do you, where do you think Walton's going to make those little tweaks and stuff? I mean, what, what's your, What's your just take on the the change in that personnel from the standpoint? Of, he's still coaching the corners, but what where, yeah. where do you think making Tim Walton the passing the pass defense coordinator is going to pay any dividends? Well, well number one, being a corner, and also I you know I coached Ohio, Ohio Dominican for a year. When you yeah. make the cornerback coach the passing uh, coordinator or the deep pass defense coordinator, you should expect more cornerbacks on the field. I mean, it's just you know like, <laughs> yeah. like let me put more of my guys out there. So um, what I would expect is to get better matchups from a passing standpoint. The other thing is, you know, we talk about guys getting mismatched and, you know, being able to take advantage. The reality of it is um, you, you, you want to make sure there's a lot of nuance in defense, right? Yeah. You play yes. cover three, but cover three can change based on what that offense is giving you. The one thing I remember playing on the coach Fickle is we changed a lot of things based on what our strength was. It'd be like, yeah, Tim, I know we're supposed to have a guy underneath there for you, but he's probably not going to get there. Yeah. So play it like man, you know, and that's that's yes. just the reality of it. So um, the expectation, just from a cornerback standpoint or a defensive back standpoint, um, understanding where the weakness is, what the strengths are, and how can we, how can we adjust or shift coverage, even though we this is the responsibility, but how do we shift and adjust based on what the offense is giving us, and make sure that we, from a coverage standpoint, are in a good position to continue to play top down and not give up explosive plays. Let's eliminate these explosive plays in a way that fits what the offense is going to try to attack us with and what their strength is. George is a great example. Again, fast guy on the field, that guy's in motion, you know, that they're, they're, they're trying to get him free. So let's yeah. make sure that we adjust for it. Yeah. I was going to say, that's like a great violinist or pianist, you know, I mean, you go from good to great based on nuance, you know, what set, right. what separates you are those little bitty things that you adjust to on the fly that you add uh, to the, to the, not necessarily add to the music, but just the way you play the music. Right. And it's the same way you can have a, you can have a assignments, et cetera, but within those assignments, you got to have room to be flexible. And uh, I think these guys will feel more comfortable playing those notes in between the notes. You know what I mean? I mean, to stay yeah. with that stupid analogy I just came up with this year like than that. they did a year ago. Uh, do you, do you get that sense too? Yeah, I like that. Playing the notes in between the notes. The other thing is, you know, this Ryan Day is Ryan Day taking this this step back as more of that CEO of the entire team. I think there's I think there's value in the head coach 
really locking in on, okay, where is the weakness at on the team? Yeah. And if that weakness is, you know, we're giving up explosive plays, especially a great offensive mind like Ryan Day, you know, how can I figure out how we can solve for these issues? How can I figure out what a Jim Harbaugh or whoever is going to try to, how they are going to try to attack us and we can make sure that we are solving for these issues. I think that's also valuable because what happens at, at the end of the day, like, you know, as a defense, sometimes you want to be an attacking defense. We want to blitz. We want to get pressure, pressure. And that's the focus. What you can, what, what, you, what gets lost sometimes is, okay, that's the focus, but we need to make sure that we keep the top on this defense. So, you yeah. know, what is the offense going to do to, to put us in a bad position? And I think a guy like Ryan Day can, if he if he has the the flexibility and the time to be able to lock in and say okay we are weak here, you know how can we make sure we continue to address this? How can I put you guys in position to make sure that you're addressing these issues during the season, during a a game against Northwestern or uh, uh, Toledo or wherever we play that's out of Miami Ohio whoever, because that's when those those things happen, and they're really small and nobody sees them because it didn't hurt us. Yeah. And that's what, and that, those things happen early, and you've got to start fixing those things early, so that when the game, when it comes to the big game, you know they can't expose those little, those little issues, those those minor tweaks that you never made during the season, and they yeah. become uh, big issues. I agree with you 100. percent And you know, a lot of times when you're a defensive coordinator or you're a position coach, you know, once the season gets rolling, you're 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 zeroed in on next opponent, next opponent. Yeah. You've yeah. got to have somebody, you know, and they've got these quality control coaches and stuff like that are supposed yeah. to be looking. But like you said, Ryan Day, who has viscerated many defenses with his offense over the years, has an idea of how I would attack. How would I attack me if I was you? You know what I mean? Right. Kind of thing, right? And uh, so that, that'll that be interesting to see if that uh, if that pays off. I, I'd call that me fence instead of defense. You know what I mean? Right. How am I going <laughs> to fix this stuff? You know, uh, uh, bottom line is, Let's get to this little chart though. That's up behind your, uh, as the fans look at this over your, over the left, the left side of you, over your right shoulder. But uh, you know this this little chart. I think I understand was pilfered uh, from the Woody Hayes Athletic Center sometime after your senior season. Do I have that correct? Yeah, I took this off the wall. <laughs> the defense of me and room. Um, I'm just gonna go on record and say um, somebody <laughs> gave me permission to do that. The statute of limitations is up anyway, man. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't know who gave me permission, but somebody did. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know, our senior year, we came up with kind of this every year. Every year, we came up with a creed. This is what this is. This is the identity of our defense. This is who we wanted to be. Um, and it was the seniors, and we had a great senior class: me, Cameron Hayward, Dexter Larimore, Brian Rowe, Ross Holman, um, Jamel Hines, a bunch of a bunch of guys who were like minded in in how we saw what we needed to do to be successful. And it was based on being a one of one eleven. So we, we highlighted that we you know will be will execute not as a one eleven, but eleven working as one. So eleven working as one was a key aspect of it. Running to the ball was a key aspect of it. Yeah. Um, swarm to the ball, attack, be relentless, and take advantage of opportunities. So uh, our mindset was getting to the ball, spreading to the ball, and just being reckless is going to create opportunities, right? And do it yeah. with some swag. Have have some confidence. Um, with you. So that was our big thing. And just understand that, you know, we had to create turnovers, punish the QB and overcome every challenge and that it was, wasn't going to be easy. Uh, we did it for pretty much every game, except I would say that Wisconsin game at Wisconsin for a full game. And that Wisconsin game, we had some, some slip ups. Uh, and that was the one loss that we had, but you know, I I think it's I think it's important from the standpoint that conversation, not so much you know the the thing hanging on the wall. It's, it's great, it's great afterwards to, to take home and and have, but having that meeting before the season and getting on the same page, yeah, is important because now we're just like we're like we're brothers and we're we're we're, we're together. We're a family together. And there's always nuance in defense. There's always ways that the, the offense can beat your defense. So it took us all being very, very connected in order to solve for it. And I remember thinking, like, you know, some of these teams, these, these Ohio State defenses, in terms of talent, I would look at this. I would look on I'll be like, these guys don't have a talent issue. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, and I start looking, and I'm saying, like, you know, if we go player for player some of these years, these, these teams are way more talented talented 
I wouldn't say way more, but they're more talented than some of my teams, right? Yeah. So what was the difference? It was a connectivity, right? You know, me and Ross could look at each other sometimes, and we knew, like, all right, you go there, I'm going to go here. It didn't even matter what the defense was at that point. This is what the offense is doing. Ross is going to shoot. If he shoots, I got to play over the top. And that's just what it came down to. Daddy is Gibson. He's supposed to drop. And I used to tell Thad, look, man, I know you don't know where to drop. If you just drop straight back, you're going to give me enough. I'm going to go make the play. Yeah. Um, and, and that was important because that allowed us to cover up the gaps in the defense. Um, that allowed us to not have to rely on the coaches to tell us exactly what to do. They already prepared us. Now, on the field, they can't play the game. So, you know, on the, on the field, we're able to work through some of the, that nuance that happens and we're able to solve for some of the issues, right? If Ross yeah. shoots, I'm over the top. So I'm protecting them the explosive play. It's now my responsibility. Not necessarily what how it's exactly designed, but I know he's going this this way, so I go the other way, and we're protected on any any type of, you know, explosive play. Yeah. Um, so that, that's pretty much what, what this amounts to, is our ability to, to communicate and have a connectivity and understand that we're all on the same page and we are the same goal to be a great defense this year and um, carry on that silver bullet um, identity. Yeah. And I was going to say the way you were describing that a minute ago, it's almost, it's, it's like also, uh, you know, if you go off, you know, if you have a, just a hunch or something on a play and you can like nod to a guy or wink at a guy or pull your ear, or whatever, whatever you did, <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that, that means you're not just doing it on your own, meaning you're not just taking a flyer here and leaving everybody else hanging, so to speak. And that's the freedom that comes with knowing each other, also being in a system for a while, right? But uh, but also, you've got each other's back, like you pointed out, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the big thing. And, and you also know everybody's strengths and weaknesses. Like, yeah. depending on what linebacker I had next to me, I knew, all right, that guy's going to go hit somebody. So that, 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 that eases, you know, some of my love from a tackling standpoint, but he's not going to get back in coverage. Yeah. I'm going to have to squeeze that dig a little bit harder then if you know if B Rose there, that dig is not gonna happen. He might pick that. He might pick that dig off, right? Yeah. So it's 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 just kind of understanding, you know, the guys, and that came from us being together, you know, for you know a few years as well. Understand being in the same defense for a couple of years, um, but it also came from us really coming together and doing this. Yeah. And now knowing like we're on the same page, so if something comes up. Before we get to the field, before we get to the game, we're gonna we're gonna address it now. So that when we're on a game, we don't even have to think about it. We can just look at each other and know what's going on. Yeah. Um, and that's very important to for a defense to be great. I start I always think about there's a lot of teams, the Oklahoma's, and they send a lot of players to the NFL, but you, you just watch their defense. And it's like this defense just isn't <laughs> it doesn't reflect the talent. No. And it's that connectivity and that, that understanding and that ability to work together as, you know, um, 11 guys working as one, it, it, it's a, it's an important piece, man. And um, I'm just hoping that our guys get there, right? Yeah. And I'm believing that they will. Yeah. Yeah, like you just described it, some defenses are like you open an umbrella and one of the panels is missing. It's a nice yeah. umbrella, but where'd that panel go, right? I mean, you're still getting wet. You know, you just hope the rain doesn't come through that panel. But, uh, you know, it's really interesting. I. Does it bother you as a former uh, cornerback and big time player uh, uh, at Ohio State? And, and let's, let's, you know, let's face it. How many national championships did your team win? So we won zero national championships. Yeah, played in so, two. Played you know what I'm saying? I mean, it did. Yeah. You know, it's like to get there finally. I mean, I think there's honor in getting to the championship game to being in consideration. You know, and then things happen. You know, one way or the other. But my point yeah. is uh, to play at that high level you know, gives you pride and stuff. But does it hurt your pride to know that a defensive lineman had more interceptions last year than any cornerback? Because no cornerback at Ohio State had an interception last year. Does that bother you? Should that bother people? So it doesn't bother me when it, it doesn't bother me for interceptions, not that many interceptions that happen. It bothers me how it happens. Yeah. Right. Because sometimes if you play a lot of man, you know, there's, there's times where there may not be a ton of interceptions. You always back to the ball a lot. You know, you get in your hands, you're making tackles, you're break, getting past breakups. However, there is there was moments where, you know, you see a safety in a position, and that safety not continue to get depth, and then they go for a big play, and you're like, 
Wasn't that safety supposed to keep getting that? Wasn't he supposed to be in that position? If they threw that ball, it would have been a pick, right? So it's it's kind of how it happens that kills me. And honestly, losing games, look, the reality is some games are going to be lost. Uh, Ohio State losing a game, it bothers me a little bit. It doesn't bother me that much. Yeah. But when they lose it, the way we lost the game, like when it's, when it's lost on big, explosive defense, if it's just tough game and they lose, it's like those guys play hard. They were disciplined. And that the team edged them out. It is what it is. But when it's when it's lost on plays where I know we have the talent to make things happen and, and not give those type of plays up, that's hard for me. Like it's literally my wife is the only one that that is on the receiving end of all the stuff that I say. Yeah, but she she has to hear me complain. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, it's hard for me. It's painful to watch. You know, talented players not you know not actually be able to show that. And being able to be a dominant defense, so yeah. that that that's was that's 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 what's harder for me more than even just the interception aspect of it. Yeah, it's kind of like boxing so, matches you see where one guy, like a heavyweight boxing match, one guy's in there throwing jabs, throwing punches, you know, doing this. He's scoring and scoring, and this other guy across from him is taking it, taking it, and just I'm going to win with haymakers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And all of a sudden he comes over the top and hits, and the guy's stunned. <laughs> And then he got back and blah, 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 and he throws another haymaker and he, and suddenly he wins the fight. You know what I mean? Just throwing haymakers. And that's kind of what those last two games were about, really, when you, when you sum it up. I mean, Michigan averaged what, 50 something yards on their five, on five of their touchdown plays. That's crazy, isn't it, Chimpy? Yeah. That's, a, this is ludicrous. <laughs> it, 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 it's crazy. It was one of, it's, it was just hard. It was hard for me to comprehend and understand, like, how could this, be the yeah. case. Uh, but it also goes to show, you know, the the value of playing defensive back and the value of, you know, being disciplined on defense. Because at any point in time during the game, an undisciplined uh, action can lead to a huge play. And that's yes. just the reality of it. Uh, and also the value of running to the ball. Like everybody gets to the ball because you don't know how many times just, you know, sprinting to the ball will eliminate some guy who broke out in the backside corner who wasn't supposed to be there. Because he's sprint, he's swarming to the football, saves a, 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 a game save. He does it has a game save attack. Yeah, so. absolutely. Hey, well, let's get to let's get to this before we get done here. Uh, uh, before we, before we summarize that, I'd like to I'd like to summarize that. Uh, you you think this defense has a chance to be what this year? Really good, great, uh, hopefully better than last year. What is just your take? Well, the defense has a chance to be great. And it is it's weird to say, given you know what you know how things transpired in the last two years, but in terms of it starts with the talent. They have the talent is there to be great. And then you look at the coaching. The coaching is there to be great. So um I'm I, I obviously I honestly would be disappointed if the defense isn't great. And that's why I'm at and to be and also you got a new quarterback, and I'm I'm hoping that whether it's Kyle McCord, Devin Brown, whoever uh, ends up leading that offense, I'm hoping that they take off. But honestly, the best way to to get a new quarterback, uh, you know, acclimated to what is what they kind of is, is to have a great defense that yeah. doesn't allow that other offense to really score score that many points. So, yeah, um, I'm expecting them to win win some games with defense at least early in the year, and I think they have a chance to be great. Yeah. And one other thing before we move on to you, you your personal stuff, which is what I want to get to anyway, taking a long while to get there. It's a long and winding road. Uh, if iron sharpens iron, like everybody always says, how come Ohio State doesn't have the greatest defensive – how come Ohio State hadn't had the greatest defensive backs in the world the last four or five years? You, you know where I'm going with that, right? I mean, yeah. with the receivers they put in the NFL, with the receivers they've got coming back this year, not the least of whom is Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, you know, one of the big lines by the coaches this after this spring was that the defensive backs were getting their hands on more balls than they were a year ago, which is a good sign. And I go, well, you also got uh, two guys trying to become the you know first year starting quarterback. So you know what I mean. A lot of things add yeah. up. But uh, but that iron versus iron, uh, iron sharpens iron thing sounds good. But how do you take advantage of that? I guess as a player. Yeah, it, it's a good point. I always, always struggled, you know, when you go against your own team, because we always dominated the offense. When I was, when I was at Ohio State, we always dominated the offense, and then it was hard to to determine: are, are we really good, and or is the offense just not good? 
And then we get to the game. I'm like, we was really good. Like, yeah. the defense is really good. Um, I think you can get trapped sometimes. And I've never – the way we did it, you know, Trestle was a – wasn't really a high-powered offense. And um, J- uh, Coach Haycock, Coach Fickle were really, really stingy defensive when it came to the defense. I think you get in trouble sometimes when you are when you have the, the head coach who has a very high-powered offense. Because a lot of the plays that – are made offensively, you say, well, we're going against our guys, and the other team's not going to be like our guy. Yeah. I think that's a mistake. And I'm not saying that's what's done, but I think that's a mistake. You know, I think you the defense should smother the offense. I mean, you're going against the same guys over yeah. and over again. You know what they do. You know their tendencies. You know what they run. Um, you should smother the offense, no matter how good they are. And then when you go against the other team, then you know, like, this is what we're going to do to everybody else. So iron does sharpen iron. However, when the 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 iron you're going against is dominating you, you need to make some real adjustments. It has to be really, really important to fix these issues. And you can't say, okay, they're just really good. But when we go against that other team out there, they're not going to be as good. No, they may be. So yeah. You need to make sure that you get to a point where you can dominate those guys in front of you so that when you go against the, those other teams, you're doing the same thing out there. So with you being a defensive guy in your past, et cetera, uh, you, you, what you want to hear about the second or third week of preseason camp is, boy, this defense, this offense is really struggling against this defense. Is that what you want to hear? That's exactly what I want to hear. Okay. That's exactly what I want to hear. And I, unfortunately, it's going to make me question the quarterback. The yeah, exactly. Right? See? <laughs> but I would prefer I would prefer to hear this offense is struggling against his defense than, boy, this offense really has it rolling against his defense. That, yeah. that would make me a little bit more uncomfortable than the other way. Yeah, that's the yeah. that's the eternal conundrum for a head coach is you want both of them to be damn good, you know, and uh, it, it and you're I would whenever you're having success on one side in practice sessions, you got to be thinking, but wait a minute, what does that mean for the other side, right? I mean, you that's the world of her, the world of a uh, worry that coaches live in, right? Yeah, I think it is, I, and I'm I, I'm defensive minded. At the end of the day, I, if I, I'm thinking in, in my mindset, if I was a head coach. I would want the defense to be all over every single thing, but the offense to still be able to make tough plays, tough catches. Yeah. Because to me, at the end of the day, if if every inch is hard to get, but you're still able to break through and get stuff here and there, then when we get to the when we get to the game, there's gonna be some open stuff where you get and this is gonna be easy. Um yeah. and on defense, it's just gonna be just another day. <laughs> you you've always made it tough. Yeah. You're gonna have to make the, the other teams gonna have to earn it. So to me, I would always want the defense to be all over the offense. Yeah. Um, with the offense taking care of the football. The key part is offense take care of the football, but I want that defense to to be as dominant as possible um and make everything hard to get. Okay. Let's get to you real quick before I get wrapped up here. You and Brad Browning had a really and I thought delicious uh barbecue place, several places going at one point. Now you're out of the you're out of the uh Barbecue business, I do believe now. You've turned it over to y'all's two other partners, and uh, you and Brian have moved on. You've moved on. You're you're building your family. You're building your career in all kinds of different other ways and stuff. But just give people an idea. Number one, uh, for example, you got a podcast you're going to be doing. Uh, talk, give give people a little bit of an idea. What's 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 in the works for you? Yeah, so me and Brian have a podcast, a Buckeye podcast called Believe in Buckeye on the Believe Network. Um, it's a podcast on all the streaming platforms we're on. Um, and really just getting that down to, you know, some of the stuff we talked about today, giving some player perspective, some of our perspective. Um, and it's fun. You know, we have fun with it. Um, now, you mentioned, you know, me, we both have. We started the the pit barbecue. We've moved on since. Um, interesting about me and Brown, we both are having our third kid in the next month and a half. Are y'all, wait a minute, are, y'all, of- are you guys twins? Go ahead now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish I could flash a picture of you and Brian Browning next to each other. Go ahead now. <laughs> so, so me and Brian book uh book our roommates. Um and yeah, we're kind of on the same trajectory. But yeah, you know, we have the, the podcast. I'm also gonna be doing a, a show with uh, uh Jared Smalley on uh, NBC every week, uh Buckeye show. Um and the other thing that I'm I'm doing is there's a a company called Cloud Machine that I'm a part of, and our focus is being able to grow this NIL market, this NIL space. So what Cloud Machine does is we we track data and metrics, objective metrics that determine what a player's marketability, what their market value is for NIL. For every 
type of engagement, uh, whether it's a social media post or whatever, we can give clarity to a business as to, you know, what your return on investment would be yeah. if you engage with this type of player. And because we have that data, we can connect brand and player. And then as we, and because we're getting a lot of deal flow, we can also take that data, provide, provide it to universities, provide it to collectives, provide it to agents so that they now have more clarity. It's a, it's a space where there's not a lot of structure They're trying to change that. There's not a lot of clarity as to what's going on. Um, and we provide a little bit more structure so that more deals can happen. That's yeah. kind of our focus. Yeah. It's a new, it's a new space. And I, you know, like you're, what, what you're getting to here is that eventually is going to be the, uh, the decider in a lot of these situations for one of another term is, okay, the flash of the NIL thing has passed us. Now, eventually it's going to be where it's not just uh, boosters giving money to collectives. And uh, eventually you got to figure there's going to be some guardrails in that regard. Okay. Now, young man, quarterback, a, uh, we really like you. We really like your visibility, but what, yeah. do, you know, what, Will, will us giving you X amount of money, what will it bring to our bottom line? Right. I mean, that's, it's eventually going to come to come like everything else does come back to a bottom line situation, isn't it? It is. And there's two parts of it. So over 50% of people in the U S are college football fans. So the reality is there's, there's the, the opportunity to engage with a player and do a deal to, you know, generate some notoriety or do a campaign and try to, you know, sell something or improve the business. But there's also kind of a mission focus where I want to do a deal because I want these players who I love to be able to utilize their name, image, and likeness to be able to um, benefit from it. So what, what Cloud Machine does is regardless of which bucket you're in, right, it still provides the metrics to say, you know, based on you know who this guy is, what he does, how many times his name is in the paper, you know, how, how many times he's playing on TV, or streaming or whatever viewership numbers he has. Yeah. This is about what he should get for that campaign. And yeah. it, you allow the market to do what it, what it does. Um, and then, you know, what, what um, people are willing to pay versus what players are doing now allows you to start to create some, some structure into where, yeah, CJ Stroud is going to get paid this much, but uh, Dewan Jones is here, right? Uh, yeah. You know, a nose tackle is here. And that's the that's, that's just the reality of the market, and it allows it to be more simplified or more structured. In any industry, it, it requires structure to grow. Yeah. yeah, that's just the reality of it. any industry requires structure to grow. Grow. So we um, u- using data tech is the easiest way to provide that structure and make it unbiased um, and and more seamless to start connecting those who want to um, affect NIL or become uh, engaged in it with those who are actually playing and have opportunity to take advantage of. Are you like, you know, even in your, from that vantage point of your, of your uh, business there, are, are y'all even hoping to see, maybe you're not, are are y'all hoping to see some kind of guidelines, some type of like legislation come out of the federal government, which further what, you know, the term is guardrails, puts guardrails on these things to where you kind of know, you know, what is and what is and isn't out of bounds. You know what I mean? What is in bounds, what's out of bounds, et cetera. Or are you, because anybody you're going down a path, if it's just a wide open path, you know, well, how, how do you really figure out what, what's coming from here, there and yonder? Are you, are you guys hoping to see some clarity along those lines? Yeah. So here's the challenge with, with, with guidelines and rules is that yes, we, we are, but we're also hoping that they put forward or the right guidelines and the right structure. And yeah. that's, that's always a challenge because those who make the rules are not necessarily the best informed on what the rules should be. Right. Um, and what we really would hope is that, you know, something like a clout machine can inform those who make the rules to say, okay, now we have data. Now we understand how what's happening in the market. Now we have the clarity to be, to be able to create the guideline that actually makes sense. And that's yeah. kind of that balance between tech and regulation, right? Sometimes yeah. you have to let the tech outpace the regulation so you know how to regulate um that market that marketplace all right last my last question along those lines Jim D your former player you gave your blood uh sweat and tears uh for Ohio State way back when like a lot of former players did uh no matter what comes out of the NIL kind of space should players be sharing in the revenue the profit uh from 
uh, football games uh, that, that the profits generated, both television, radio, uh, live seats, et cetera, should they be sharing some of that because of yes. the jeopardy? In fact, they put themselves in uh, 12, sometimes maybe 15, 16 times a year with the coming playoff. Yes. Yes. I mean, the, the reality is, you know, the, the bulk of the money generated is through TV in, in those areas. And yes, yeah. they should be able to, to generate some income from it. Because that, if, if we just break it down just from, you know, what, what capitalism is, you know, if you are um, part of the ability to generate the, 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 the money, you should be getting paid for that. Um, and that's just the reality. That's that's just how the society and how things are built. That's, that's the economics of, and it's and it's a good way to do things, right? It drives more competition. It drives more innovation. Um, Pop machine is is one of those things that are participating in some of the innovation. But the reality is, they're part of what's generating that growth. Um, so they should be able to uh, benefit from the growth that's happening. And I'm hoping that they do. And and at a minimum, I think one of the biggest areas, and I think there's going to be they're going to address it. Um, here sh soon is the healthcare aspect of it. Yeah. The reality is football is a hundred percent. If you ask me, what's the percentage of injury in football? It's a hundred percent. You're yeah. getting hurt. It's not if, it's when and how bad. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you know, there's a ton of guys who I played with who finished college, didn't make it to the NFL, and they're still dealing with the the impacts of concussions or injuries that have to go back and get more surgeries, and that's just the reality of football. That's what it is. That's what everybody signed up for. Um, but if at, at a minimum, um, anything that can provide healthcare services beyond, um, you know, the college career would be hugely important, especially because you're, you're talking about a growing market with more and more money being generated and these guys playing, getting bigger, faster and stronger. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Into the we which circles back to the beginning of our conversation, Denzel Burke getting out there no matter what, you know, week in and week out for the most part, even though he's banged it. Tommy Eichenberg finally playing with two broken thumbs. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, you can say they're doing it for good old you, but uh, they're never doing it for good old themselves to a certain extent. Cause you, you know, football games are very rare. You know what I mean? You only get maximum, maybe a 15 in a year uh, or 12, you know, if you don't go, go anywhere uh, post season, but so you want to play, right? But you also want to understand that your jeopardy is being taken into account, right? Yeah, it's 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 a tough. I mean, I I still go back to my junior year. I played with that, you know, in my hip, and I didn't think nothing of it back then, yeah. you know. Yeah. But you go back and you reflect, and you're like, man, I really put a lot of risk um, for my future on a season that I could have just, you know, really focused on improving and, and, and getting myself to a point where I'm up. I mean, not just my, my future football, yes. <laughs> it's just future in general. Um, and that, and, that, and that's a big thing. And you, these guys are young, they're in a position to where they're all fighting for the same goal of, of getting to that next level. And that next level is very, very limited. It's a limited space for those guys. Yeah. No matter how good you are, it's only a limited amount of people who can get there. Yeah. So it's not about talent at that point. It's about the space to get there. Um, but they've already reached a level that's uh, at the top of their 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 industry, and they should be compensated in some way for that, based on the growth of that industry. And that's where I, I struggle the most is that this is a growing space, and it's growing because of the guys who are performing. So as it grows, they should be able to partake in in, in that growth in some way, shape, or form. At a minimum, minimum. They, their health care, their health should be taken care of based on the risk that they're putting out there. Ladies and gentlemen, Chimdi Chekwa, as, I, as I've told Chimdi many times when I'm on Channel 10, uh, my mic check, a uh, little segment where they give us a mic check, Tim, I always go, Chimdi Chekwa, Chekwa, Chimdi Chekwa. <laughs> hey, Chimdi, thanks for joining the Tim May Show again, man. I hope your, uh, I hope your uh, podcast uh, goes gangbusters too. And uh, the one with Jared Smalley, one of my favorite people ever, Hope it uh, hope it takes off for you, man. I uh, appreciate you being on with me again. Yeah, it's always a pleasure talking to you, man. It's always fun, man. So I appreciate you having me on. And by the way, thanks for bringing the props. I appreciated that also, man. <laughs> Even though it's hot. It's a hot <laughs> 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 but, but Ladies and gentlemen, Chimdi Chekwa. And until next week, this is Tim May. I'll see you then.